for those of you who might be new to MLUX, a little bit about who we are and what we do. And um, then we'll move into the case study. So hello and welcome uh, to MLUX Seattle-ish uh, <laughs> adjacent. Um, thank you to Sam and Y Labs for hosting uh, and for letting us use your Zoom uh, information. Uh, and uh, we're excited to start our talk in Driven by the Data, the intersection of ML and UX. Um, but really quickly, did you know that Sam also hosts a really cool other meetup? Do you want to share a little bit about this, Sam? Uh, sure, yeah. We have a sort of sister organization that's focused on um, really sharing the knowledge and uh, sort of things that people need to think about when operating um, AI systems to make sure that they're operating with robustness and, and the people operating them are, are being responsible about how they're building them. And we have a number of meetups. Um, the next one is April 15th, uh, where we have Anna Swigert. I think that's how you pronounce her, her last name. Um, I think, Michelle, maybe you can give a few more details after the talk, but yeah, we'd love to see you there. It's a, it's a cool group of um, individuals, more on the AI practice side and the design side and so there tends to be uh, technical deep dives and lots of great discussions in that forum yes thank you so much for sharing that and um here is the link if anyone is interested i can share it in the chat um but i am personally really stoked about it because um data is incredibly important as we are going to discuss today um so thank you for sharing and hope to see some of you there um so let's dive into it Hi, welcome to MLUX. Uh, you might be wondering what MLUX. Um, I am the only one kind of speaking right now, but you, as you see, there are a ton of volunteers and folks who help make it possible. So thank you to everyone who has volunteered. I know a lot of you are in the audience today. Um, let's dive in. So like machine learning, UX, how do those kind of go together? Well, we like to think about as how do we use data to inform and drive UX design decisions, but also how do we design better experiences around that data and let our end users kind of know what's going on, how they can control it, give feedback to the system. Um, and for those of you who might be new here, uh, we like to think about UX as much more than just like pixel on a page, but really what is the experience, the whole user experience, as well as, um, uh, you know, how do we think about every part of the data from how it's collected to doing AI and machine learning, all this stuff too. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how we kind of think about it. And when those two come together, um, they make fantastic experiences like this. So this is Pinterest visual search. And as you scroll through, you can easily receive the search without like going back up to the top and typing stuff in. Um, so we are really excited about examples like this and more. Um, if you're at all interested in reading more about like what is MLUX, um, definitely check it out. Uh, we wrote up a Medium article on it there too. Um, so yeah, but that's like, what is MLUX is like a field, but what about us as a meetup? So our vision really is to create a collaborative environment between uh, UX data science and everyone in between and come together and share these best practices in the form of tech talks or panels, um, just like we're doing now today with Sam, who is a chief product officer for a startup up in Seattle called Y Labs, but has a ton of experience on being a designer for AI systems. So we want to hear from folks like you on like, uh, what, uh, how do you do this approach of combining design and AI in interesting and cool and novel ways? And, you know, it's together as a community that we will help, uh, uh, you know, change the future of this field together. So um, that's why we exist. And also we're free. So like, totally uh, feel free to show up. If you have like a, a talk you might want to pitch, totally uh, email it to us. But um, if you're at all interested in following us on any other channels, don't worry, we're on every channel. So um, we are definitely on Twitter and I'll be live tweeting tonight. Um, but we also post all of our, our prior talks on our YouTube channel. So if that's of interest to you too, like Sam is recording the talk now, um, we'll be posting that up onto our YouTube channel as well. So learn from uh, prior talks as well. There's a lot of cool stuff out there. Um, but the last thing I'll just uh, kind of say before we get into the case study is like, uh, we can't have events without you all. So um, big thanks to Sam for stepping up and being like, wait, I have something cool to share. Like, yes, totally, we love it. Um, and all the folks who have shared stuff before in the past too, if you have like a, a cool talk or approach or best practice that you'd like to share um, with the rest of us, totally feel free to email us, um, humans, humans at mluxsf.com is the best email. Um, but yeah, we totally wanna hear from you. Um, the last thing I just want to kind of give a shout out to before we turn it over to Sam is that 
Um, all of our events are free thanks to Feminist AI and the larger nonprofit that we are a part of. So Feminist AI um, is helping reimagine AI for everybody um, and reimagine the, the future of AI. And so if this is all of interest, you can totally check out their GoFundMe, um, but also just take a look at some of their other stuff that they, they post. I do free tutorials for them. Um, but yeah, the, the whole reason why we do this is so that way anyone, regardless of wherever they are in their career, can join in. So on that note, um, I'm going to stop sharing because I am personally really excited for Sam's talk. Uh, uh, oh, I forgot to share the last part where it's like your headshot and everything too. I'm That's literally okay. that excited. Um, no. Sam, you're here. Uh, we're so excited to hey. have you. Thank you for speaking to us. Well, thank you, Michelle. Let me try and get the screen sharing going as well. Um, and I'm totally going to share and chat to uh, Sam's Twitter handle as well as YLab's Twitter handle. But um, yes, I <laughs> seriously can't mention enough how thrilled I am to have you here and for you to share a little bit about Y Labs and really what it is that you do is, is design and data combined. Um, so yes, okay, I'll stop talking. Take it away, Sam. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sam, and thanks to Michelle and all the ML UX team for having me today. I'm really excited to give this talk about what it means to be driven by data. Um, I figured it'd be nice to start off with a little bit of my background. Um, I've been a design practitioner for almost 20 years. I started off in graphic design and then transitioned into UX around 2008, which is coincidentally around the, the time that I got started with my first startup. Um, after that, I took a job at, at Amazon and, and then spent half of my career at Amazon working in enterprise UX for the um, programmatic ad platform. Um, this was my first experience of design that was being driven by data, not just the design process, but the need to build simple to use interfaces for customers to access metrics and analytics about their ad campaigns. And after the, the ad platform, I jumped into a team um, for an internal data science platform, which was just getting started. In many ways, um, this team was exactly like working for a startup, even though it's a bit of a cliche that working at Amazon is like working in the world's best funded startup. This team actually fit the mold pretty well. Uh, we stayed small, we moved really fast, we had a ton of autonomy, and we grew our product to where it has been used by thousands of people in the data science community across the whole of Amazon, and even into AWS, uh, where eventually we got absorbed into to SageMaker. Um, when I was working on that platform team, it's where I met my co-founders in YLabs, and, and these days I'm the product experience lead, uh, as well as a founder at YLabs. Um, a little bit about YLabs, our mission is to build um, the interface between human operators and AI applications. Well, what does that actually mean? Um, it means that we've built a data and model monitoring platform that, that can detect anomalies, data drift and data quality issues at all stages of the ML pipeline. Um, the idea is that we enable all stakeholders visibility into the health of AI systems. And this is important because costly failures can be avoided by detecting issues and alerting the right people in real time. So to summarize um, this sort of long-winded intro, I, for, throughout my career, I've been involved in, in some type of work that's been driven by data, which brings us to why we're all here. Um, I just wanted to take a quick look at some of the things I'll be covering. And, and I'm gonna point out that for any of the scientists who are attending, a lot of this is gonna be fairly familiar or very familiar, so just bear with me. Uh, I'm framing this through the talk, uh, this talk through the lens of being a design practitioner, given that, it, that it's my background. Um, so I'm gonna give a quick primer on why we all need data to do our jobs. Um, we'll look at some of the challenges when working with data and cover some of the, the core concepts when working with data. Um, we'll dive into a section that's all about data quality. Dealing with data quality issues are really common for AI practitioners. Um, they know that if you feed bad data into an AI system, the data coming out of it in the form of predictions is also going to be bad, which can cause all kinds of issues. Uh, so in this section, we'll cover some of the basics to help the non-scientists get up to speed. Um, and then I'll close out with a few thoughts about opportunities for the data savvy practitioner. 
So what do I mean by driven by data? Well, Zach Wilson from Airbnb provided a couple of interpretations for data-driven and data-informed. Uh, he's saying here that there was a difference in the decision-making process when using data that helps with the, either business outcomes or improving the customer experience. Um, being data-driven or data-informed is different from being driven by data, in my opinion. So I'm not really going to get into the pros and cons of e either approach today, but instead I'm going to make a case for trying to blur the boundaries between the two job families that rely on data and try and break down the silos that we tend to operate in as both AI practitioners and then design practitioners. So when I was thinking about this talk, I kept arriving back at this one point that every AI and design practitioner really needs data. Um, we maybe think that this is something a, a little taken for granted on the design side. We partner with researchers and product managers. We feel comfortable with how we need to use data in the design process. And then we also hear people talking about working with big data um, with more and more enterprises migrating their data off-premise and into the cloud, access to it is becoming easier, uh, and there are more opportunities to work with this big data. And this is the forum where you'll typically find your business analysts, your data engineers, uh, data scientists, ML engineers, all applying their trade. But it does create this sort of boundary between the two disciplines, and, and it's much more difficult to work with the data uh, when it's moved into the cloud and all its different formats and structures and, and um, storage um, solutions. So I think we should try and soften this boundary, figure out a way to kind of bridge the gap. So in one sense, data is quite literally the intersection for both machine learning and human-centered design. And um, Michelle has a very similar slide in her intro. This is kind of the same slide, but framed around data. Um, the design process is improved when it's driven by data, and the ML process is driven by data by its very nature. Uh, both disciplines are driven by data, just in different ways. Uh, designers need data to improve the user experience, and um, data can help demonstrate the value of our work. AI practitioners need data not only to train, test, and operate models, but to demonstrate the value of their work as well to the business, how you can demonstrate ROI. The, their work needs to really move the needle in a positive direction for the business as well as customers. So whether it's looking for patterns and data in order to make predictions or analyzing data to generate insights to measure our designs, we all need to be really comfortable with the processes, challenges, and formats that comes with work that's driven by data. And I apologize for having a weird kind of sunlight thing on my face here. Maybe I'll just do this and it'll be less distracting. Um, okay. As designers, our data understanding and access to data can be the difference between a project failing and succeeding. So let's just talk about data in the human-centered process for a minute. Um, as designers, we're always told to be data-driven. We partner with researchers and product teams to generate and evaluate our work with users. We identify ways to fix problems or come up with new solutions by looking at data. Broadly speaking, it, it can be grouped into two buckets. Someone kick me out of here. We have on one side our qualitative data. So things like interviews and focus groups and diary studies can all um, contribute to ways that we generate and evaluate the data. Um, you know, you can think of a user study where you observe participants struggle with controls that are on different sides of a, a big screen uh, in order to complete a common task. And, and you come to the conclusion that you should move those controls closer together because that would be a better experience for them. Um, on the other side, we have quantitative data, uh, things like device telemetry, usage metrics, sensor data, and even KPIs are all examples of quant data. And they enable us to evaluate and analyze. Um, an example here might be pulling usage metrics from an analytics tool you're working on because you're curious um, if there are some common date ranges that have been set in the calendar. You have this idea that by looking at the data, you can come up with some smart defaults to save time when people are using the calendar. Um, 
if we simplify this a little bit more, it's really two buckets. Um, on one side, we have sort of non-technical uh, folks who can work with qualitative data pretty easily. It sort of plays to our creative sensibilities. And then on the other side, quant data is just much more technical. You need to have more technical understanding and capabilities to extract insights from that data. Which brings us into this statement. Um, from my experience, this is a pretty common thing to, that you hear in enterprises. It's like, okay, got this great idea. How do I figure out where the data is um, and how I can uh, use that data to answer some questions? Uh, I've heard people say, I'm sure people in, in the um, talk tonight have heard people say it. They may have even said it themselves. Um, but there are typically always hurdles that get in the way of, of trying to get to the data in order to prove out your ideas. So some of the things on this slide, I said myself, um, I've heard people say at Amazon, um, and they're all problems that non-technical folks are going to encounter when trying to work with data. But these problems aren't unique to designers or design practitioners or non-technical non people, um, with the exception perhaps of not knowing SQL. I guess, you know, um, I would expect all technical folks to know some SQL. Um, even some designers know some SQL. But I guess my point is that AI practitioners struggle with many of these same problems. Um, and so it, it sort of leads to a question, which is how can we be driven by data when these friction points and problems so frequently get in the way? And so that leads us to another statement, which is with all of those problems, we realize that working with data is much more than just the data itself, right? The data is like a piece of it. There's an ecosystem all around it. Um, to the scientists in here, this is going to be a fairly obvious statement, but to other folks, it might not be. Like I showed on the previous slide, there are a lot, lots of challenges to deal with. Um, we need to know what data we have available to us. We need to know how it's structured. Uh, we have to understand how to get to it. And in order to work with it, we need to know how to check its quality. So, if we were walking into a library to try and find a book, we would know exactly what to do, right? We would figure out which department our book is gonna be in. Uh, we would go to the department, we would find the author on the shelf, um, and then we would look up the, the title. But when you're trying to find the data that you wanna work with, it can just be much more difficult to, to know where to start. Um, and as I said, this is a problem for AI practitioners as well as non-technical practitioners. Um, even though data scientists are much more comfortable with navigating all the problems, getting to, to data, because they, they have to do it all the time. So let's say you found where your data lives, awesome, um, which could be in the cloud or it could be on premise. Um, you might then realize that the data is so large that it's actually impossible to work with locally. You can't just download it to your laptop. Uh, in which case you'll need to spin up an EC2 instance or some other cloud compute instance in order to load it into memory to start working with it. Or perhaps you can figure out a way to take a tiny sample and save it down to your laptop to work locally. Um, either way, just getting to the data can be a huge pain and, and lots of technical hurdles sit in the way of actually starting to work with it. Um, and it might be about now, if you're a designer, that you try and dial in a favor from a friendly ML engineer to help you with this. Awesome. Let's imagine you managed to get the data somewhere where you can access it easily. That only took you two or three days. Awesome. Um, before you can actually work with it, you, you need to get a sense for what shape the data is actually in. Um, most often, it'll be in some sort of structured format, such as a table or CSV file. You can think of Excel as being your stereotypical table format. But it could be in other formats as well. It could be semi-structured and JSON format or it might be in a format that actually lacks structure. Think images, video, text, audio, or speech, um, or it might even be time series data. The data format is typically coupled to the process that produces the data. And data can be produced by um, user interaction, logging user interactions, or it can be produced by logging uh, system outputs. 
It can be produced by things like phones or IoT devices. Um, but ultimately, the format of the data is going to affect how you get to work with it. Um, but for this talk, let's assume you're working with structured data. So you've got the data, you understand its structure, and now you're going to start working with it. Awesome. The last thing you need to do is take a look at the data and see um, how high quality it is. You need to figure out if there are any issues to try and fix them before you start working with it. Because if you don't work, if you don't fix the data issues, you'll be working with bad data that will lead to bad insights and then bad decisions. Um, bad data in machine learning systems can result in huge costs when predictions go wrong and the stakes are really high. Um, companies can experience huge, huge losses. Um, so that could be losses of customer trust to losing customers themselves. Um, this is all going to lead to loss in revenue and, and loss of reputation. And, and some of these damages are irreparable. Um, so if we know that bad data can lead to bad decisions, anytime we're working with data, um, anytime we're doing work that's driven by data, we each have a responsibility to check that it's clean and of high quality. Over the course of my career, I've learned a lot about the value of data and how it can help you make higher quality decisions. Um, I've learned that when operating AI applications, being able to check for data quality is really important. And this is something that all data scientists should know how to do, uh, and they do it frequently. But for other non-technical people, it can be really difficult. You might not know what constitutes a data quality problem and you might not know what to do to your data in order to clean it up. So let's say um, your friendly ML engineer buddy pulled some usage data for you um, uh, because you have a few hypotheses that you'd like to try and answer. The first thing that you'd want to do is to make sure it's clean and high quality. And there are a few simple steps that you can take to improve the quality of your data before you start working with it. Um, remember, quality data enables you to make quality decisions. Um, and again, apologies to any data scientists in the room. Um, you're going to be familiar with these techniques, so just sit tight through this next section. Let's dive in. OK, first up is um, you can go ahead and remove any irrelevant pieces of data that don't, don't fit the context of your issue. Um, you need to be a little bit careful about what you remove because you, you wouldn't want to delete some values that you might need later on. For example, um, you might have to measure the average age of your sales staff um, so you could get rid of their email addresses. Um, you could just delete that data, the data, or perhaps you're interested in how many customer contacts happened last month, but you pulled a year's worth of data. So again, you could just get rid of 11 months worth of data. Um, these deletions or removals are going to reduce the size of your data set and, and then just speed up uh, the process of working with it. Um, that being said, before you remove a particular piece of data, you should make sure that it's really irrelevant, right? You, you don't want to remove something that you might need in the future uh, because there are some sort of correlated values check that you have to do at a later stage. And if you're unsure about whether it's really irrelevant or you might need it later, you should um, lean on someone more experienced before removing that data. Um, but once you're assured that the data is irrelevant or unnecessary, just go ahead and get rid of it. Um, and so similar to irrelevant values, duplicates are only going to increase the amount of data that you need to work with and waste your time as well. Um, and you can get rid of duplicates with simple searches. Um, now, you could have duplicates in your system for a bunch of different reasons. Perhaps you combined data from multiple different sources and that resulted in duplicates. Or perhaps a person um, submitting the data repeatedly um, did the same action, like hitting enter twice when they were filling in a form. Uh, whatever the reason, you should just go ahead and remove the duplicates as soon as you find them. So I'm going to take a little sip of water here. Yeah. 
And the next thing that you'll want to take a look at uh, are typos, uh, which are the result of human error and can be present anywhere in your data set. And you can fix typos with um, a bunch of different algorithms and techniques. Um, some of those techniques are manual, things like spell check or find and replace. Um, but typos are really essential to fix because the same word spelt differently is going to be considered um, unique by models that are using the data. Uh, and so one really common issue is uh, as simple as title casing, the same word, um, but one time it has a capital, the other time it's lowercase. Um, that type of issue can make it uh, can have a big impact on the ability for the model to make accurate decisions uh, and another thing is uh, it's important to remember that strings rely a lot on on, on both the spelling and the casing generally speaking um, similar to typos that the size or length of strings is also important for example your data set might have a column that should contain a five digit number um, and you see that some of the values in that columns only have four digits so you'd want to go ahead and address that in this case you could add a zero to the beginning of the number to increase its number of digits um, one other thing to look out for with strings comes from white spaces. You should check and remove unnecessary white spaces from your strings in order to keep them consistent. So these are pretty simple techniques that are just going to improve your overall data quality. And then lastly, um, you need to keep in mind that data type should be uniform across your data set and you'll want to resolve any data type issues. What that means is a, a string can't be numeric, nor can a numeric be a Boolean. Uh, there are several things to keep in mind when it comes to converting data types. You need to keep numeric values as numerics. Check whether a numeric is a string or not. If you entered it as a string, it would be incorrect. But this can be pretty tricky at times because a string might appear, appear to be numeric if you're not familiar with the data. Um, everyone knows zip codes are, are numbers, but they're actually strings because you can't meaningfully add two zip codes together and get something that's uh, meaningful if you try and add them. Um, if you can't convert a specific data value, you should enter something like NA um, and just add an annotation or a warning to show when a particular value is wrong when you're doing this type of cleanup. And then the last thing uh, to take a look at is missing values and cleaning those up. There's always going to be some missing data. You just can't afford it. Uh, afford it. You can't avoid it, if I can get my words out. Um, so you should know how to handle missing values in order to keep your data clean and free from errors. Um, a particular column in your data set may have too many missing values to be useful, right? So in this case, you may decide to get rid of the column altogether because it just doesn't have enough data to work with. Um, but it's really important to note that you shouldn't ignore missing values. If you ignore missing values, it can be a significant mistake. Um, they can contaminate your data and you won't get accurate results when you're working with it. Um, there is another way to, to deal with missing values and that's to impute them, um, which means assuming their approximate value. Uh, if you're comfortable with stats, you can use linear regression, or you can work out the median uh, in order to calculate the missing value. But these methods also have their own implications because you can't be sure if what's imputed would be the real value, right? It's some type of imputation because the value is missing. Um, if missing value, uh, if the missing value is numeric, uh, you can just put in a zero. Just make sure that you ignore these values doing any sort of statistical analysis. Um, on the other hand, if the missing value is categoric, you can just add a string like missing, and then it's going to show up as the missing category when you're analyzing your data. All right, so that was a quick data quality primer. Um, to the non-technical people um, here today, the steps I just outlined can actually still be pretty tricky to work through. Um, but knowing about the steps is useful in of its own right um, for any project that's driven by data, even if it helps you have a better understanding of some of the challenges that your AI practitioner colleagues have to deal with. Um, one way to cut down on the manual process is to monitor the data as it flows through your ML system and to alert on issues when they are detected.
In fact, that's the reason why uh, we started Y Labs. And um, this GIF is pretty choppy. I apologize. I put it together late last night, but hopefully you get a sense for some of the, the things that we have in, in our tool. Um, the reason we started Y Labs was to try and solve the painful problem of identifying data drift and data quality issues for any team operating AI. Um, so we built an observability platform for data scientists, um, and it enables you to visualize the quality of, of data as it flows through um, your ML system in real time. When issues arise, uh, we generate alerts and via notifications, Slack, email, pager duty, service now, the right people can be notified and looped in um, to go and, and take a look at things when things start to go wrong. Um, y Labs currently is something um, that data scientists can use, but for the non science folks here, th there's actually another tool that I would recommend called Trifactor. Um, and Trifactor is super easy to use, and you can sign up for a 30 day trial at trifactor.com. Um, and within a few minutes, you can go find a, a data set on Kaggle, and then you can upload the data into Trifactor and start to take a look at it, wrangle it, and clean it up. Um, it's a great tool for non scientist practitioners to try out, especially if you're looking for ways to improve your data understanding. So just to close out a few thoughts about opportunities for the data savvy practitioner. As we know, enterprises are continuing to invest in building AI systems, which means that there's an increasing need for data scientists, ML engineers and data engineers to build and operate ML applications responsibly. But what do they use to build and maintain these ML systems? Well, the software and tooling needed to operate these systems is just as important, right? Um, these tools should enable all practitioners to do their jobs with minimal friction, but they should also offer a way for any stakeholder to partner and collaborate with their science teams so they could be this bridge across the whole organization. Um, the tool should provide transparency around how AI systems operate uh, to, to help ensure that they're operated responsibly. Much wow. <laughs> In addition to data scientists, it's the data, it's the designers, researchers, software engineers, and product managers that build these ML tools. And all the companies on this slide continue to make significant investments in machine learning and the infrastructure required to operate models in production. Building the tools that are used in these organizations presents some of the toughest design challenges and engineering challenges that you can find. Um, for them to be designed well, you need to have empathy for your users and you need an understanding of the data that they're working with. Um, and the common factor in all of these tools and processes is that they're all driven by data. And that brings us to the end of this case study slash talk and um, just a few final thoughts and next steps. Um, you could go try uploading some data to Trifactor Check out Kaggle.com. They have a, a cool tool for visualizing data that's hosted on Kaggle. Um, go bug a friendly data engineer or data scientist. Pick their brains around some of the things that they work on, some of the challenges, and maybe there's an opportunity to, to work on a, an initiative and, and make their life easier. Um, you can try Ylogs, which is our open source library that's sort of the entry point into Ylabs, the platform. Um, it's available on, on GitHub. You can just Google it. It's more for the, the data scientists and ML engineers in the crowd. Uh, and then we're also interested in hearing from you if you'd like to participate in a Ylabs user study. And that concludes my ML UX chat. Thank you so much, Michelle, and the rest of the team for having me. Um, I'm sure all of us are clapping, but we're on mute and without videos. This is the saddest <laughs> round of applause. Um, but yes, no, this is awesome. And I think uh, you might have seen me like nodding along uh, actively. That is because I have been tweeting out a lot of these resources and tips that Sam has been sharing. Um, as I mentioned to, uh, oh, here, there, everyone's saying thank you in the chat. I think thank that this was guys. a fantastic primer and also just like a good refresher for us as to like all of the areas like 
that we make assumptions about our data and like where it actually goes wrong and like how much of it is actually like a truly a design decision about what data we choose to collect or not collect and all this stuff too. Um, so if you're interested, I tweeted out a lot of the resources from Sam. We're also going to have this recording and everything too. Um, so uh, hold on, let me just finish my last tweet. Take a look at Sam's next steps. Thank you for ending on a next step slide. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we're going to move into the Q&A portion. Some of you have been pinging me um, your direct questions as well as uh, asking in the, the chat. Um, so let it, and maybe I could take over for a second. And yeah, let do... me stop the share, please do. Um, so we, and as Sam shared, uh, he has a presence on Twitter. Y Labs has a presence, so uh, definitely take a look at that. Um, and if you do have other, like you want to follow along for other really cool stuff, um, uh, the founders of Y Lab actually run a really great meetup uh, under the hood about a lot of this. Stuff. Look, um, but I'm going to move into the question portion. Put your questions in the chat as well. Um, I will say I did get multiple pings that your voice is very soothing. And so a lot of people oh. really enjoyed your speaking. So great job there. That's not a question, more of an observation. <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> so we have a question. Yeah, you did great. Uh, from uh, Alice, Alyssa, uh, do you have any tips or resources for designers who are designing M uh, Oh no, my connection or Michelle's connection just dropped out. I think it's Michelle's. So do you have any tips for data this without any data science background? Sorry, can you just repeat that question, Michelle? You, you dropped yes. out. Oh my gosh, my internet has been fine up until now. Do you have any tips for any designers who are doing data viz type stuff but don't have a data science background? Um. I mean, I don't, I don't have a concrete resource to point people to right at this moment. I can definitely dig up some things that would be useful. Um, I, I think the, the main thing is that you can really find a wealth of knowledge being shared uh, online. Um, one place you might like to look, there's a, a data visualization society that's pretty active on LinkedIn. It's run by a couple of the folks that used to be at Netflix who now have a startup called Notable. Um, they have a great community of very passionate um, data viz practitioners, um, and they share a lot of cool work and um, and some of their sort of findings and, and process that they get they go through through the LinkedIn group. So that might be one starting place. Awesome, thank you. I think I found it. I think I shared that in chat. Um, feel free if someone else finds it, feel free to share it there. Um, but that's a great yep. great. Point. This is this is them. Yeah. Awesome. That's... Yeah, and there's a lot of resources out there about storytelling with data and everything too. Um, okay, so we have a question from Kian. Um, uh, firstly, thanks for the talk, Sam. Maybe a little of a broader question, but are there any like aha moments or realizations that pushed you to take the plunge from Amazon into co-founding Y Labs? Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I think the, um, the sort of, there were a few aha moments a lot along the way um, the main aha moment was that when we were working on the internal data science platform um, we had great chemistry as a group of co-workers and i think that's a really important factor in any startup um, i think everyone brings a lot of talent and perspective to the table again also very important not not specific around the, the technical side of what you do as a startup but then over the course of, of working on a variety of different problems and, and solving these problems at scale, we really identified a huge opportunity to, to do something like this um, outside of Amazon. And, um, and I think that was really part of the, the sort of significant aha moment of saying, hey, what if we all decided to go and figure out how to build something for ourselves? It's great working at Amazon or Google or Facebook. Uh, but there's something a little bit different when you actually, the company, the employees, uh, you, you have to go and get the customers and then uh, prove out your fit in the market. And so um, that was really part of the motivation is, hey, we were doing this at Amazon. 
what if we went and did it for ourselves and made a difference and really um, charted our own course through this kind of new era of ML ops and, and sort of um, AI ops that, that's sort of happening right now. Uh, love it. And yes, plus a thousand, your co-founders are all very, very cool and very talented people. And um, it's like, just to maybe add on to that, I absolutely love that you all have identified something that like maybe a large company wouldn't necessarily invest in, but is clearly a problem. And so thinking about that from the beginning, really about like data monitoring and all that stuff too, I think is um, a really great way to kind of flip it on its head about like, what do, how do we actually approach this instead of post hoc and said, think about it as it's coming in. Um, and I'm so excited to see the GIF of it too. Like I want to see more of those visualizations. I think that's really awesome. Um, okay, so we have a question from Anmol. Uh, how do we strike a balance between giving users more visibility and insight into the algorithm's backend uh, working while also ensuring the overall experience does not get overwhelming or confusing? Um, and I think for all data visualizations, yeah. Yeah, so one of the things, well, there's probably not a, a really simple way of answering this, and it's a really good question to kind of throw out. Um, I think that the the challenge that that we have at, at Y Labs is that we have um, a, a sort of package that needs to be run within the the local perimeter. Uh, that sort of calculates logs and generates profiles that we then send up into our platform. And, the, and we don't actually have access to some of those um, algorithms and how the algorithms are functioning. Our process means that we're calculating approximate statistics. So in essence, we're imputing a lot of the things that we see in order to, um, to sort of monitor and track data quality. Um, there are techniques like explainability, um, but we're currently not operating in that, that area. The things that we do that um, rely on our own algorithms are the monitor algorithms. So when you're monitoring, there are a couple of different ways that you can monitor. You can monitor against a baseline, right? So you have some baseline data that is going to define the thresholds that you're monitoring against. And then anytime your data quality um, exceeds those thresholds or there's a variance, you would trigger an alert. That, that's kind of brittle. It doesn't enable you to have great insights or tune it very well. So we have our own monitor algorithms that sort of look at the previous seven days worth of data and establish a baseline that rolls across that period and then is sort of dynamic. And we provide some visibility into the fact, into the fact that those um, algorithms are active and then even some hooks into the hyperparameters in order to tune them. Oh my gosh, awesome. And uh, love that you are taking something that is Typically, I've heard a lot of people very much do it manually of like, yes, I compared this to whatever and automating that so that way it's just easier. You could really focus on um, like, hey, how do I actually get better insights for, from my data? Um, on that note, too, I do have a question, and this was also up in the, the higher chat, um, as well as a question that was sent directly to me of like, can you share a little bit like you have a wide range of expertise and experience. Can you share about like, what are some questions that data can help, quantitative data in particular can help um, fill out a full picture about your users or, or anything like that too, um, in ways that you might have used it before? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, there is sort of, anytime you're trying to fill out a picture of your users, you have to, you have to start the process with coming up with the questions you want to answer. So this is going to be a fairly hypothetical answer to, to a hypothetical question. Um, and so um, the examples that I, that I included in um, the, the section talking about both quantum qual data sort of illustrates one thing that we, we have been doing. We wanna figure out how people are using certain parts of our application. So we analyze the data that we collect um, using Heap um, as well as Google Analytics, and then we can piece together different stories to sort of user flows through the system, what are the common interaction points, and then come up with meaningful ways to improve the experience. Um, and you sort of triangulate that with heuristics and any of the sort of um, qualitative 
insights that you, you get from running those activities and, and sort of come up with an approach that makes sense. Sorry, I can't provide more concrete um, examples, but it's really it's really driven by the sorts of um, questions that that you come up with that you need to answer with the data. Yeah, that is a great point about like, it depends. I mean, what are your questions? And like, um, I think one thing that I definitely use data for is like, hey, I might see it qualitatively, but how much of it actually happen at scale? So like, I want to see metrics wise, like, oh, what proportion of users are getting stuck in a certain area or things like that too. Um, so uh, maybe helping flush out, is this truly a problem? Okay, I want to be mindful of time and I want to give Alyssa a shout out for already sharing her LinkedIn and chat. Um, a big part of this is just to get folks to meet each other and say hello. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up with a final question, um, which is, Sam, you have a captive audience here and a bunch of people who are going to watch this recording. Uh, what would be like one tip or piece of advice you want us all to take back to our teams tomorrow? Oh, um, one tip. <laughs> or piece of advice? Well, it depends what type of team you're in, right? That's your depends answer. Um, I think for, for designers um, or design practitioners, you should start bugging people that you work with to, to get access to data, right? Like figure out how you can pull down some clickstream data, figure out how you can get to other types of data, and then start to formulate some questions that you might want to try and answer and, and try some of these tools that, um, that were in, in the talk. Um, yeah, that would be my, my advice for the data scientists. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you could, you could bug your friendly designer and go for coffee with them and say, hey, what are, what are some of the things that are important about the human-centered process that can help us work um, more effectively together? How can we collaborate to come up with compelling experiences that solve certain problems that leverage ML? Love it. Um, so your biggest tip is like collaborate more and just have those conversations, which I think is increasingly harder, oddly enough, with the remote working. So um, thank you for giving us permission to collaborate with our colleagues. Um, no, that's awesome. Definitely. If, if you if you're not um, if you're not in the realm of working with a lot of um, sort of the, the other data types, the data that is typically used to sort of build, train and test ML models on, um, go try and get hold of some of that. Figure out, go figure out what it's like to try and work with it. It's going to be super painful. You may discover um, opportunities and how you can like go and pitch a team on coming up with this awesome new process that's going to change the way the whole data science community does this one thing. Um, so yeah, go, go get some big data and start playing with it. I love it. Thank you, Sam. And remember, Sam has a background in design. He's a designer being like, yeah, work with data. It's awesome. Um, so thank you uh, for the big plus one to that. Um, I will just end very quickly on uh, some really cool events that are coming up. Um, one, uh, we have an event happening uh, later this month for MLUX. Um, here, I'll post it in the chat, but it's on um, kind of a, a similar topic to this around uh, uh, designing AI explainability features. And it's a, a Kai paper. So if any of you are interested in Kai, this is a Kai paper. And we'll have one of the authors from that kind of share her approach um, to that of Switzerland. So it will be early in the morning uh, Pacific time. Um, but lastly, I wanted to also uh, uh, share again um, the robust and responsible AI uh, Meetup uh, R Squared AI has an event coming up very soon on April 15th. Um, Tim, do you want to share anything else uh, about this? Um, I know there's some notes um, that are more specific about the type of work that Anna is doing, but I don't have the presentation open, so I, I, I could try and remember, but I would get it wrong. And so if, you, if you're able to just um, yes, speak totally. to those points, that would be great. Um, yes, yeah, so in this talk, Anna will outline a framework for how to invest uh, in preventative health for data. Oh my gosh, so important as we talked about today, um, including choosing the right data vitals to measure how to keep 
that data from propagating throughout the system, early detection of anomalies using ML-driven tools like Luminaire, and being systematic about cleaning up the data clutter. So uh, I think that's super fascinating. If you like this talk, this is definitely one that you should check out as well. Um, and especially take advantage for um, those friends of ours who have tuned in from all over the world. Like everything's remote right now, totally. Come be present with us. Um, and on that note, I want to just say thank you so much, Sam. Thank you for speaking and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, thank you to all of the folks who helped make this possible. And uh, we only have three more minutes to get a chance if you if you want to stop the recording and if folks want to chime in. But um, can we give Sam a big round of applause again? Virtual applause. <laughs> thank you, guys. Yay, awesome. thanks, Jamie. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been great to share some of these ideas with this crowd. I really enjoyed it. Oh my gosh, thank you for sharing them. I'm like I'm really happy that we recorded this too because I am